Tune in to Inside tonight to hear Grammy Award winning recording artist The Chainsmokers perform Summertime Friends from the American Express Roadshow stage. We welcome you back here to Denver, opening night of the NBA season. And uh, Special great guests. to have the commissioner of the NBA, Adam Silver, join us. Good to see you again. Thank you, Ernie. Can't believe it's, it's going to be 10 years wow. for you in February uh, as the commissioner of this league. And, and one of the cool things you get to do is nights like this. Uh, and especially when it's a, a franchise that hasn't had one of these in the NBA. What's that mean to you to be part of this tonight? Yeah, no, absolutely. You can uh, hear it from this crowd around us that the first championship ever for the Denver Nuggets. And I was around the team earlier this afternoon and the ownership and they're over the moon. Let's uh, let's talk about the offseason, talk about the things that were uppermost in your mind. And one of those was getting the players to play, to put it bluntly. Right. Um, and so how do you feel like you have addressed that and and gotten to a point where fans can say, you know what, when I go to the arena, when I pay my money, I'm going to see the guys I want to see. Yeah, most importantly, we addressed it by working directly with the players and the Players Association. I think everybody understands that the fans, this is about the fans, we're an 82-game season that ultimately that if a player is healthy, the expectation is he's going to be on the floor playing. By the way, I, I, you know, it's, it's also important to make clear this isn't about turning the clock back. I mean, Guys who played this game before played often at times when they probably shouldn't have been out there. And so it's not about making guys go out there when they're injured or they shouldn't be playing. It's about healthy guys playing. It's an, it's an understanding that ultimately that this is about the fans. There's an expectation, whether it's that family in the arena or family watching on TNT, that they want to see the best players on the floor. I understand the rules, but how can you enforce it? Because, you know, a lot of times, if I say I'm, I'm hurting, I can't play, but like you can't really judge pain all the time. So how are you going to enforce this law? Well, that, that's a great point. And as a last resort, we'll bring in independent doctors to look at players. But that's where I start by saying this is about the relationship we have with the players and the Players Association. This is about a partnership. It's about understanding what drives this sport, what drives the business of this sport, and that's seeing the best players on the floor. There are a few things, though, for example, the 65-game minimum we put in the collective bargain agreement. Again, the expectation isn't that guys will play only 65 games. That, that's a minimum based including injuries, but also a notion that the league has set a policy. We're getting directly involved. We're creating incentives for them to be on the floor, to be eligible for certain awards. And again, I don't, I don't think this needs to be adversarial. It's not the league against the players. I think when we sat across from the players in collective bargaining and discussed this, there wasn't any disagreement in the room about what we needed to do. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, and, and just last point on that, a, a lot of that also is management. You know, load management comes from the management of the, you know, executives. All of those devices that the players are wearing aren't player devices. Those are devices that are given by the teams. So the teams come out and say, hey, this is an opportunity for you to sit down. You've hit a threshold. So it's collectively working with not only the players, but also the team owners and team management, letting them know like, we need to, we need to have the Yeah, Ken, Kenny, board. that's a great point. And, and I want to make clear, this isn't about the players not wanting to play. To your point, load management was a concept that came from our teams, a, a belief that by strategically resting players, they were going to perform better later in the season. And the fact is, having had a bunch of seasons of data now, frankly, to look at it, it's not proven in any way that it's effective in terms of keeping, in fact, injury rates haven't declined at all despite the load management. So part of it is also just looking at the experience now we've had around that concept and recognizing that it, it's not advantaging anyone. Well, let me say this. I'm talking to the players, man. Forget the ownership, forget the fans. As a player, if you're gonna make 50, 60 million dollars a year to play basketball three or four days a week, Play basketball, man. Now, if you're injured, if you're injured, don't play. But everybody hurts after the first two weeks of the season. Your, your legs sore, your knees sore. If you're injured, I don't want you to play. But the notion that, number one, bless these guys. You're making 30, 40, 50 million dollars to play basketball four days a week. Y'all got the best shoes. You got the best medical staff. You got these guys sleeping in chambers. You got ice baths. 
Man, if you can play, shut the hell up and play. I don't know that there was a question in there to you. It wasn't a question. <laughs> what have you got on your mind for the commission? I want to know because explain to me, because everybody asking me, and I've had a couple of conversations, what is the in-season tournament? So in brief, the in-season tournament is taking games that were already part of the regular season and making them count towards winning an NBA Cup, which is sort of a, a series of games where there'll be a championship, here are the rules up on the screen, that will culminate in Las Vegas, but it's, it'll, it'll result in pool play and then a single elimination round. Um, there'll only be one additional game for an 82-game season. The 83rd game will be the two teams that emerge will play a single elimination cup championship in Las Vegas in December. So it's, it's a concept that we took from international sports where, and, and our international players, like I was talking to Luka Doncic, when we were in Abu Dhabi together and we were talking to him there about it, the international players know the concept well. There's been this tradition, well, ultimate goal is the championship, in our case, the Larry O'Brien Trophy. There's a long history of other cups, other competitions. College does it here. They'll do a Thanksgiving tournament or a Christmas tournament or whatever else. But here, so it's, it's a separate competition, mm -hmm. prizes, financial prizes, and a new tradition we hope we can create but, but these are these so are actually be, regular season they, games. Yes, they count yeah. for the with the exception of the last game. They're, okay. they're also regular season and games. So would it be accurate to just compare it to you say college? You're playing in the Great Alaska Shootout. Exactly. And you're trying to win it, yeah, like the same way that you would be playing in any the other. The, and the only difference is that these games count in the standings. These are part of the regular season. They part of the the, the, the record that determines playoff and playoff seeding. And what was the percentage of players that liked it and, and players that disliked it? You know, it, it, we've been talking about this concept for a while, and I'd say by the time we agreed to it with bargaining with the players this past summer, it was pretty universal that guys were accepting. That seemed like a good idea. I think, again, back to even the player resting issue, there's a recognition from the players in this league that we got to keep interest from our fans and that we have a, a, a long regular season, particularly in the first half of the year, that we're competing against NFL, college football, there's other interests that, that people are following, and so let's create some more excitement around this league. Is and, college and football I, in Colorado? No, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my yeah. Bad. Oh, my bad. Definitely I'll, college football I'll be, in Colorado. I'll be honest with you, too, uh, Adam. When it was first announced that, that they were going to do this, my first kind of thought was, why do we need it? The more, the more I looked at it and saw, like, there was, there were some traits of like World Cup and that kind of thing with point differential mattering where you can get down to the fourth game for these teams and say, look, if you want to go to Vegas and be in this, you need to win tonight and you need to win by six or right, whatever. Right. So so it, it, there's that to get used to. Um, and I guess kind of to Chuck's point, everybody was asking you, and, and I've been getting this saying, yeah. what's up with this tournament? When do you expect, like, a buy-in from, from NBA fans on this? Well, we'll see. You know, it's, it, it, as I said, it, we recognize creating a new tradition is going to take time. And to, and to Shaq's question, guys caring about the M NBA Cup, I don't think that's automatic because they're used to only caring about the Larry O'Brien trophy. But I actually think once it starts, you know, there's going to be a different look. There's going to be a different floor, different uniforms. I think guys are going to get excited about it. And that's the discussions we've been having. Again, Kenny and I were together in the preseason just talking to, we were talking to Dallas Mavericks. They were excited about going out there. And what I'm hearing from teams around the league is like, let's go win this. I, I, I agree. I think, you know, it's, it will take a second to adjust. But it's the same thing as when you're in college basketball and you're at University of North Carolina, University of Duke, you know, you're all of these top schools that are playing in these huge tournaments that are inside the season. The ultimate goal is to win the NCAA championship. But in those moments, I'm like, we're winning this tournament right, right now. We're going to win this. Yeah, but is it your fear that, you know, guys are going to say, I don't want to get hurt doing this thing. I'm not going to perform at a high level. Well, but they're regular season they're games. regular it's, second it's, games. You know, it's yeah. the same thing. Well, to me, actually, I feel better now about the tournament <laughs> because I know because Ernie I didn't know they were regular season games yeah, already on the schedule. I thought it was like a specialized thing. Yeah, it'll be so, Tuesdays and Fridays yeah. in November. So now I actually feel better about the. Yeah. I, I just found that out because everybody asked me. I'm like, I don't know what the hell it is. Yeah, yeah. let me let me shift gears with you, uh, Adam, and in the time we have left. How much do you stay in touch with the Memphis Grizzlies? How much do you stay in touch with John Morant, who will not? We won't see him till Christmas. Um, what? What do you know at this point about where he stands in terms of 
coming back and turning the page. So our folks at the league office have regular updates with, with Ja and the team. So we, we came up with a program together, a combination of counseling and other things he's doing to work through, frankly, his issues. Um, he and I have not talked in the last several weeks, but again, people in the league office have, have. his progress report has been very positive, and I, I'm hoping he can put these incidents behind him. I mean, he's an incredible talent. He's a young man, I, at least in his direct discussions with me. He never made excuses. He acknowledged he made mistakes and then mistakes on top of mistakes. And we'll see, as I said last time, I mean, the proof will be in how he chooses to live his life when he comes out back into the league and, and, and performs on the floor. I, I got one more question. I don't care. He, he says go to commercial, but I got a serious question for you. There's a couple of disturbing incidents of domestic violence in the NBA right now. What are we doing to address that? Because that is a, you can't put your hands on women, man. And we should be at the forefront in sports when the men hit women. So what are we as a league going to do about that? Well, again, you know, I, I, that's an area where we're not looking to compete against other leagues when you say forefront. So I think all the leagues are trying to address this issue. But I know, again, our, our, our Players Association, credit to them, this wasn't adversarial. We put in place a new program for how we deal with, uh, it, first of all, accusations of domestic violence even before they're prosecuted. Part of it goes to training of our players, uh, counseling of our players to make sure they understand during high stress situations that like obviously never resort to violence against anyone. And so we're addressing it. We have, you know, state of the art uh, counseling professionals dealing with our players. But of course, and if a guy, you know, does cross the line, the consequences are enormous. Adam Silver, always a pleasure seeing you. I know you got business down the road tonight. You got uh, you got rings to hand out to the Denver Nuggets. I appreciate very much you spending the time with us. Thank you, guys. Have a great year. Yes, indeed. You too. Thank you, brother. We will take a break. Here on TNT. <laughs> that boy bad. Hey, oh, thank you, Edie. Season 39. Hey. That's Eddie. That's Eddie. That's, that's Edie. That's, is that Eddie? That's a bad man right there. Jamal Murray, the Denver Nuggets. That's on their home Hey, floor. Harry Douglas. That boy bad. Taking on the uh, Los Angeles Lakers. The season opener here on TNT. <laughs>